What's going on everybody? It's me Martin, the lead designer, back with yet another devlog. This devlog was originally supposed to be about something else, but in the meanwhile, Epic Games finally released Unreal Engine 5 on the 5th of April, and they say that this is Epic's largest technology release to date. And ever since then, we've gotten a lot of questions from you guys asking us whether we're gonna move to the new engine version or not, and we replied saying that we are not going to move to it. But I think that this update deserves its own devlog because Unreal Engine 5 isn't just another minor version update. It is a product that contains some truly revolutionary features and in my opinion is of the same magnitude as moving from Windows 3.1 to Windows 95 back in the 90s. But instead of just throwing around some technical jargon that nobody really understands, what I think we ought to do is we ought to go through all the main features together so we get an idea of what they are, how they work, and discuss some pros and cons. So let's jump right into it. So this is our plan of attack for this devlog. First, we're going to briefly go through all the main features. Then we're going to see what the minimum system requirements for Unreal Engine 5 are. We're going to compare those requirements to the latest Steam hardware and software survey, which is going to tell us what hardware the, the average Steam user is currently using. Then we're going to see how much money the average Steam user would have to spend on upgrading their PC to match the requirements of Unreal Engine 5. After that, we're going to check out the Matrix demo, which is a demo map showing off all the features in Unreal Engine 5. After that, we're going to try and convert our current UE4 project to Unreal Engine 5 which should be a breeze. According to Epic Games, Unreal Engine 5 is fully backwards compatible. Then we're going to compare the performance and visuals of both engines. Then we're going to discuss some of the new features more in depth. And then finally, we're going to come to some sort of a conclusion. So let's get rolling here. So we obviously haven't got time to go through every new feature, but we're going to go through the main ones. The first of which is Lumen, specifically Lumen Global Illumination and Reflections. And what this is, is it is a new ray tracing lighting system, which is supposed to mimic the way light works in the real world by bouncing off of objects, and it also gives us some nice reflections. So if I move this slider over here to the right, so we only see the scene that is rendered with Lumen on, we can immediately tell that this scene is not lit up in a uniform way. There are some very bright areas of the scene, and there are some quite dark areas of the scene. So let me explain what's going on. Let me turn on my handy dandy drawing tool. So what's going on here is that the sun is kind of positioned to the right of us and behind us. A happy little sun. And what the sun is doing is it's emitting light rays in all directions. But some of the light rays are hitting the facade of this building right here. And they're bouncing off of it as they would in real life. And, and the light rays that bounce off of it are mainly landing in this area right here. Causing the facade of the building and this area right here to be quite bright. But if we bring our attention to this part of the scene over here, it's quite dark. And that is because... Not many light rays are making their way into this part of the scene as it's obstructed by this highway bridge. Whereas if we look at the scene that is rendered with Lumen off, we see that it is lit up in a very uniform way. There are no real bright spots. There are no real dark spots. Everything looks pretty much the same. And so that's the main difference between Lumen and the old lighting model. Let's go back to the scene where Lumen is enabled and check out this shadow. Three quarters of this scene is covered by a shadow, but notice that the shadow isn't completely grey, but it's kind of got a beige tint to it. And that is because the light rays that are bouncing off of the facade of this building are absorbing some of that beige color from it, and as they bounce off into the shadow here, they're causing the shadow to take on some of the color from, from the facade of this building. Whereas if we go into the scene where Lumen is disabled, well, the shadow just has a uniform gray color. It's not absorbing any of the color from the facade of this building at all. Let's go back to the scene where Lumen is enabled again. Notice that the back parts of these cars are very dark, whereas the front parts of the cars are quite bright. And again, that's happening because of the light bounces. Let me turn on my drawing tool again. 
So remember, the sun is right here and the sun rays are hitting the facade of this building and they're bouncing off of it and they're actually hitting the front parts of these cars, causing them to be brighter than the back parts of the cars where the, where the sun rays are not hitting it at all. Whereas if we go back to the scene where Lumen is disabled, well, we don't get that effect at all. The, the car is just lit up uniformly all around. One more thing that we can notice in the scene where Lumen is enabled are these nice soft shadows underneath every car. If we switch back to the scene where Lumen is disabled, the cars do not have any shadows underneath them. Now notice how much depth and perspective the shadows give this entire scene. See that? This scene where Lumen is disabled looks very flat. But with the shadows, it all looks very three-dimensional. And last but not least, notice that the facade of this building right here is actually being reflected in the clear coat of this car's paint over here on the roof. Whereas if we switch to the scene where Lumen is disabled, we'll notice that the facade is not being reflected in, in the car's clear coat. In fact, nothing is being reflected into them. All there is is a generic cloud pattern. So yeah guys, that's Lumen in a nutshell. I'm sure you get the gist of it. Let's move on to the next feature. Nanite is the bombshell here, guys. Nanite's virtualized micropolygon geometry system enables developers to create games with massive amounts of geometric detail. You can directly import film quality source art composed of millions of polygons. Absolutely. Up until now, your entire scene was limited to like 2 to 3 million polygons, whereas now you can have that amount of polygons just on one object. This is crazy, guys. It's kind of hard to explain how this works here. We're going to have to see that in the Matrix demo and then when we jump into the engine. But this is going to completely change the pipeline of how models are made. It's going to save so much time because you no longer have to make LODs or worry about performance and all those things. Another great feature is called Mass Entity and it is still experimental. Mass Entity is a framework for data-oriented calculations that allows players to interact with tens of thousands of simulated entities at high performance. So what that basically means is it allows us to have thousands of AI characters on the map without any real significant impact on the performance. Let's go ahead and play this animation and check it out. So this is from the Matrix demo that we mentioned earlier, and we're going to check the system out when we play the demo. But check this out, we've got hundreds, potentially thousands of cars just driving around on this map, and it's having no significant impact on the performance at all. Now, I don't think that this feature is actually multiplayer compatible, so even if we did move the project to Unreal Engine 5, we probably wouldn't be able to take advantage of this. But if we had a single player game, it could potentially allow us to have thousands of zombies on the map, which would be pretty cool to say the least. Another thing that's worth mentioning is if we zoom into this picture, notice that the AI, that the cars and even little people are visible all the way in the back here. So it's not like games like the Mafia series where you're driving along and then cars appear out of nowhere because they had to be despawned. There are literally thousands of AI actors just walk around this map, visible all at the same time, and it's having no significant impact on the performance whatsoever. So let's check out Unreal Engine 5's recommended hardware requirements. And remember guys, you always want to go for recommended hardware requirements. Don't go for minimum. Go for recommended so you can always take advantage of all that particular application's features. But first, let's check out what I got. I got Windows 10 an Intel i9-990K CPU running at 3.6 GHz, 32 GB of RAM, DirectX 12, and I have an NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1060 video card with 6 GB of video RAM. So let's see how that stacks up against Unreal Engine 5's recommended requirements. Operating system, Windows 10, I got that. Quad-core Intel or AMD, 2.5 GHz or faster, I got that. Memory, 8GB of RAM, I got that. Graphics card, Direct, Direct X 11 or 12 compatible graphics card, I got that. And there's a note here. To get the most out of rendering features of Unreal Engine 5, such as Nanite and Lumen, see the requirements for Unreal Engine 5 rendering features section of this page. Aha! See, Nanite and Lumen come at a price. So let's see what that price is. 
Lumen Global Illumination and Reflection Software Ray Tracing and Hardware Ray Tracing. Video cards must be an NVIDIA RTX 2000 series and higher or an AMD RTX 6000 series and higher. So I already don't meet the system requirements for Unreal Engine 5. Now technically I can do software ray tracing which we are going to have to do when we play the, the Matrix demo but that is going to lag severely. So what I really need is hardware ray tracing. Nanite Virtualized Geometry, Windows 10, DirectX 12, Latest Graphics Card Drivers, Virtual Shadow Maps, Windows 10, DirectX 12, Latest Graphics Card Driver. Temporal Super Resolution, runs on any video card that supports Shader Model 5. Alright, so it all boils down to the NVIDIA RTX 2000 series or AMD RTX 6000 series or higher. Basically, I need a new video card. So, let's check out the Steam Hardware and Software Survey and see what the average Steam user is working with. And... Survey says that as of April 2022, your average Steam user has 16GB of RAM, a 2.3 to 2.7GHz CPU with 4 cores, and an NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1060 video card, exactly the same one that I have, but with 8GB of video RAM, whereas I only have 6 so I'm pretty much in the same boat as everybody else. So let's see how much we'd have to spend to upgrade our PC to use hardware ray tracing. I'm going to search for an NVIDIA RTX 2000 series video card on Amazon, since that is the base requirement. And what? $620? Um, where's the sort feature? Sort low to high. $380. $400. Is that shipping included? Plus $100 shipping? What? Alright, I'm gonna try and search for an AMD RX 6000 series video card and hopefully that'll be a little bit cheaper. $400? $179. Alright, so it looks like your average Steam user would have to spend about 400 bucks to upgrade their car to meet the minimum requirements. But what I think is important to bear in mind is that we shouldn't be asking the customer whether they want a feature because the customer will always tell you, sure, I want that feature, and I want that feature, and I also want that feature. What we should be asking the customer is, are you willing to pay for that feature? Are you willing to spend 400 bucks right now to have that feature? And the only way to find out is to play the Matrix demo and see what it all looks like in action. Well, here's the demo, and here goes nothing. Hopefully my video card is still under warranty because it is about to be put under severe stress. Wow, very Mafia 2-esque. And here we go, here's our character. What does that red text say? Video memory has been exhausted, expect an extremely poor performance. Yep, that's what I pretty much expected with my video card. But, let's see how much FPS I'm getting. It's that FPS. 12 FPS, wow. That's quite, wow, did you see what happened to that car? That car was on top of that other car. But yeah, 12 FPS, I was expecting it to be a little bit higher, but I can't complain because I'm not meeting the minimum system requirements. Or the recommended system requirements. So anyway, let's take a look at this city. So obviously this city is modeled based on New York. And this is the first time I'm playing this by the way guys. So first impressions are, wow, this is like the most realistic city in any video game that I've ever seen. Wow. There are some of those AIs that we talked about. Also, the detail on this character is quite high. She's got some bumpy things on her shoulders there. Very detailed, you can even see you can even see little hairs on top of her head. 
Um, I've got mixed feelings about this. On the one hand, I'm kind of shocked at how realistic this is, but on the other hand, I grew up in Canada when I was a kid, and I haven't been there for like 20 years, so kind of standing here in this photorealistic environment is also bringing back some some memories from there, so I'm kind of getting a feeling of shock, but... Also a nostalgic feeling at the same time. I mean, the details of these textures on the road and everything is crazy. Some of these assets are recognized from the from the epic, not the epic marketplace, from Quixel. Which is an app where you can download all types of photo scanned textures and models from Epic and you can use them in your Epic Games projects. And we also got some assets from there in Tavina the Origins. I've got to say that the environment looks way more realistic than the people do. Hello, average American shopper. Hmm, I guess people aren't too friendly in the city. No way, is that a Ford Crown Vic? Wow, it is a Ford Crown Vic. When I was a kid, my parents and I immigrated to Canada. We landed at Toronto's Pearson Airport at like 10 in the evening. I, I must have been like 5 or 6 years old back then. And we took a yellow Ford Crown Vic taxi like this. Well, we told a taxi driver to take us to the cheapest and, well, just the cheapest motel that there is because we didn't have any money. And the taxi driver ended up being Polish, so he kind of understood what we're trying to say. And he ended up driving us to a town called St. Catharines, which is right beside Niagara Falls, about 50 miles south of Toronto. And so this was the first taxi or the first car that I, that I rode in in Canada. Wow, this brings back so many memories. Are these cars drivable? By the way, a fun fact about St. Catharines is that the Welland Canal runs through the town, which basically allows you to bypass Niagara Falls because you couldn't sail down Niagara Falls, right? Well, I mean, you could, but you probably wouldn't get very far past them. So essentially what that allows you to do is you can sail all the way from like Detroit or Chicago through the Great Lakes, through the Welland Canal into the St. Lawrence River and from there you'll make your way into the Saint, into the Gulf of St. Lawrence and from there, well, you can sail anywhere in the world. By the way, fun fact, do you know or did you know that most cities in North America are actually ports? They might not have it in their name, but they are actually ports. Los Angeles, Seattle, New York, even Detroit and Chicago are basically ports. Check out these reflections, guys. This building is being reflected into the roof of this car. Check that out. Although I have to say that the reflections on the glass don't look all that nice. They look much better on the clear coat. Hmm, I wonder if they made the tags the same or if the tags actually have different numbers. Hey, they do have different numbers. Nice touch, Epic Games. Nice touch. Oh, I remember these yellow things. Yep. These these are very handy. I haven't seen them anywhere in Europe, but... They should definitely start placing these things in parking lots in Europe. Hey, and the cars are drivable. We'll be driving this Ford Crown Vic later on for sure. So let's see what the menu does. There's a map of the city. Oh, wow. I love this interface. This is based on the old Macintosh Classic operating system. I used to have an old Macintosh when I was a kid. So let's see what we can do here. We can play with the sun rotation. Can't see much here. We're probably going to have to go somewhere else where we can actually see the sun. Crowd density. If I turn off the crowd, will that have an... Let's see if I turn off the crowd and the traffic and everything. That has no impact on the FPS. So remember we talked about the AI feature? We've got thousands of AI characters walking around the map and even if I turn them on or off or if I turn them to the maximum, it has pretty much no effect on the FPS of this game at all. I think I've run into an invisible wall. 
See, there's an invisible wall here. Even this AI is stuck. What's going on? It's the Matrix. There's an invisible wall. Hey, hey, scusi, scusi. My bad. Let's try to go around it. Yep, we can go around it fine. So there's an invisible wall right there. So I've come to the edge of the city here. To kind of this pier. I wonder if the clock works. Hmm. But anyway, hopefully we'll be able to see what the sun looks like when we change the rotation. Wow, this city is huge, man. Look at this. There's like a Manhattan Island on every side of the city. Wow, this is crazy. See what the ocean looks like. Not the best ocean I've ever seen. But I guess it'll do the job. But anyway, let's go into our menu here and try and change the sun's position. Or the sun rotation, rather. Let's see where we are. Sun rotation. And hopefully we'll see a nice sunset. Whoops, what did I do? Oh, there we go. There we go. I'm looking for a nice sunset. Oh, it turns out we're just changing the rotation of the sun, but we're not actually changing its height. So we're just rotating the sun in a circle. Ah, man, that sucks. I thought we were going to get to see a nice sunset. But check this out. Fully dynamic shadows everywhere. Everything's looking pretty nice. By the way, these interiors don't actually exist. This is fake. This is actually a material. This is the matrix. Nothing is as it seems. Let me show you. Let me go into the menu and... Where was the setting? Nanite view. See? If, see? Notice that? There's nothing there. There are no models there. It's just the material. I think that this looks pretty good when used when used on rooms that are very high up because you can't see all the details but i wouldn't necessarily use it on the ground floors because it just looks a little bit too blurry wow check this out this is awesome check out the details in these ornaments guys see this is the real power of nanite this is all geometry let me switch to Nanite view again, and I'll show you. Let's see here, Nanite view, default, triangles. Check that out, guys. This is ridiculous. Check out all those triangles. I mean, these ornaments around this doorway probably contain more triangles than, like, the entire city of Mitrovic on Taviana. This is insane. This is the real power of Nanite, guys. There's no LODs and nothing. This is just hundreds of thousands of polygons being rendered in real time. Wow, I imagine this is how you see when you're on LSD or something. I think that I found the Devil's Headquarters. Well, I found a bug. There's just a hole into the abyss. Hey, I'm walking here. I'm walking here. There was a mail truck like this parked in the street next to my house in Canada, and I'd always go sit in it and pretend to drive. <laughs> Let's check out some of these people here, by the way. Hey, hey, scoozy, scoozy. Yeah, the hair is a little bit too shiny. But otherwise, I have to say that the environment looks much better than the people. And that's because Nanite doesn't work on skeletal meshes, meaning models that can be animated and move like these people, you can't use Nanite on it. Those are just regular models. Here we see a crowd of more people. Whoops. My bad. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> this guy's on his smartphone. That's a nice touch. Hurry, 
What state is this anyway? Oh, it just says Unreal. <laughs> ah, that's a pretty nice touch. Is it just me or can I hear a train? Alright, tell him. The boys are checking me out. Ah, uh, what? There's a night mode? There's a night mode, bro. We need to check out the night mode. Wow. Look at that. Wow, I've got to say the night mode looks way better than the day mode. Wow, this looks like super realistic. Wow. Look at that. This looks awesome. Wow, this looks incredible. All the reflections and the puddles just pop at night. Look how far we can see into the distance here. Wow, this is incredible, bro. Look how far we can see. Look at all those lights. Wow, I've got to say, nighttime is... This is bringing back all kinds of nostalgia from when I was a kid living in Canada. I don't know why, but nighttime mode just looks ultra realistic. Let's see what the trees look like. Hey, the trees have no leaves. Is it like winter time? But there's no snow on the ground. That's strange. Well, I think that's because the nanite doesn't actually work on trees either. At least from what I heard, because trees also sway in the wind, so technically that's also an animated model, so... Don't quote me on this, but I, I think that nanite doesn't work on the trees either, that's why there's no trees, that's why there's no leaves on them. Because if there were leaves, you'd have to animate them, otherwise it would just look weird, right? Let's try and drive a car. Ah uh, man, I really want to drive that Ford Crown Vic taxi, but I don't see them parked anywhere, so we're gonna have to go for the next best thing. Which is the silver one right here. Alright. This is going to be a very laggy experience, but better than nothing, right? Let's wait for a green light. There we go, green light. Wow, look at that background, guys. This looks absolutely incredible. This looks incredible. Well, I don't think you can make right turns on a red light in New York State. Or at least New York City, but... Wow, the controls of these cars aren't very good. Oh, there's some of that damage. <laughs> that guy's just dragging his bumper behind him. Are we going to try and make our way? Wow, these controls are clunky. Whoops. Wow. Did you see that? That was a nice effect. Yeah, 11 FPS isn't enough to drive. Let's see what happens if you run somebody over. Whoops. Well, that didn't go to plan. Where did that person disappear to? Doesn't seem like we're going 77 miles an hour. I mean, this is very fast. This is like... Like 140 kilometers an hour. Let's see what happens when you run somebody over. Nice damage effect. Well, I managed to flip a car over, so at least we can get a look at what's underneath it. And I gotta say, this is very detailed. There's the exhaust pipe. Differential. Whoops, what happened? I guess I'll just get back in and continue driving then. So yeah guys, that was the Matrix demo. I think that we've seen pretty much everything that there is to see. And what we really want to see is what Taviana the Origins is going to look like in Unreal Engine 5. So let's go check that out. So I've made a copy of our project from Unreal Engine 4. Epic says that Unreal Engine 5 should be backwards compatible and that porting projects over there should be as easy as right clicking on the project, selecting switch engine versions and then selecting 5.0 and clicking OK. And we're going to check out what it looks like next time because this video is getting way too long. And this is also a good cliffhanger. So I'll catch you guys in a couple of days.
Meanwhile, if you like what we're doing here, please subscribe to the channel, give us a thumbs up, leave a comment in the comments box below, and please consider supporting the project on patreon.com slash Origins.